We're joined instead this morning by the Liberal Democrat Majid Nawaz from the counter-extremism think tank, the Quilliam Foundation. Let's go straight to what he was saying. I, do we put any credence on his claim that it's, it's the reason he's beheading people is the fault of MI5? I mean, look, Andrew, I'm, I'm sitting in front of you. I opposed the Iraq war from a jail cell in Egypt as a political prisoner. I remain opposed to Guantanamo Bay's continued existence. How does it figure? How, does it, how do we come to a conclusion from that to theocratic fascism is the answer? It's absurd. You know, the Taliban complain about U.S. drone strikes. What's the relationship between U.S. drone strikes and whipping women for not covering their faces? What's the relationship with U.S. foreign policy and enslaving Yazidi girls in Iraq? This discourse, this victimhood entrenched Islamist propaganda narrative is absurd, frankly. How do you read Cage? I mean, until now, they've kept a relatively low profile. They are supporters, not just of... Uh, people who have been charged with terrorist offences, they often give some quite a lot of comfort to those who have been convicted of terrorist offences as well. Why have they decided to take, helped I think by the media, I mean we've just done it ourselves right now, to suddenly have this higher profile? What are they up to? Well, yesterday the nation, as you've just said, was subjected to a glorified Islamist uh, megaphone press conference live on television in which Asim Qureshi, who I went to university with by the way, I've known yeah. him for many years, um, was given this uh, un, an unchallenged platform. What I would have hoped is that the BBC ran side-by-side -side commentary, perhaps with someone like Frank Gardner, who is, uh, who's been a victim of terrorist atrocities himself and has lost the ability to walk because of Al-Qaeda. Side-by-side um, -side commentary along some of the spiel that Asim was putting out would have worked a lot better. What are they up to, though? Um, well, they are effectively, I mean, they are, it's not that they are pro-Islamist, they are actually Islamist. Um, uh, when I knew Asim, he spoke at a, a pro Hizb Tahrir rally that was organised by Hizb Tahrir, calling for jihad, the caliphate support. Is that the one we can see online? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's the one. The, I mean, I, I spoke the, at the, that same The rally. one when he had a full head of hair. That's right. That's I, him. Yes, There's that's no him. doubt that that's um, him. I, I was there. He was the warm up, hmm. warm up act for my speech. Oh, right? then you thought. Yeah, I, I actually know that was him. I you was were standing lucky not right to next be taped to him. then. <laughs> well, there is a tape of me out there somewhere. But this is an Islamist organisation that actually justifies uh, theocratic fascism when pushed. They are followers of Haytham Haddad, the extremist preacher that was actually eventually prevented from speaking at Amwazi's former university, Westminster, yesterday, where he was due to speak. That same university, by the way, um, had at one stage a few years back uh, a, 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 a supporters of Hizb Tahrir as the president of the student union. These are, this is a group that glorifies the Islamic State. Let's look at the more important criticism of the security services, or potential criticism. Not that they're responsible for uh, this man becoming a beheader, but that they had been tracking him as far back as 2009. They, it looks like they tipped off the security services when he was trying to get to Somalia, which is what they thought he was he, he was doing. Um, but in the end, he managed to get to Syria and become a jihadist. I mean, was that a blunder? Have they blundered, or is it just impossible to stop these people doing what they do? We've got to be fair here. You know, I'm 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 grateful to our security services that we haven't had a serious attack. Obviously, we had Woolwich, but we haven't had a 7-7 style mm. attack on a mass scale in Britain since then. However, you know, and, and we do blame them. We tend to blame them when they try and recruit informers, as Cage have just done. Yet at the same time, when people slip through the net, like these three girls last week, we also blame them for not having the information. They can only have that information if they have the informers. So they're, 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 it's a very difficult job. But of course, they, they do bear a level of responsibility for allowing somebody like Amwazi mm. to get out of this country and become the world's most notorious killer. You see, the reason I ask, and it is important, is that Adi Balaja, who was one of the two Woolwich uh, killers of uh, Gunnar Rigby, uh, I mean, he was known to the security services as well, and yet he went on to kill a British soldier off duty in the streets of London. I mean, is it a lack of resources? Is it an inability to be able to keep tabs on these people non-stop? Uh, what's the yes. problem? I mean, so they would push for uh, greater data surveillance powers. That would be their solution to this. Now, I would argue, I'm a liberal. I'm inherently cautious about increasing the power of the state. I, t I tend to say that no amount of law nor war is going to allow us to get through this because what we're really dealing with is a grassroots ideological insurgency. And unless and until we get to grips with uh, being able to face this ideology he head on, as was done with racism in this country, it's now somewhat a taboo. It's still a long way to go, but it's certainly changed from when I was growing up. We need to be able to have the intellectual clarity and courage to be able to do that with the Islamist ideology. You you mentioned, though, you were a Liberal Democrat, and it was your party that insisted on the scrapping of control orders, which the previous Labour government uh, thought were rather worthwhile or useful in keeping tabs of the kind of people we've been talking about. Was that a mistake? 
No, I think actually what was a mistake was the securitization of this agenda during the previous administration, including uh, whether it's control orders, stop and search, detention without trial, rendition to torture and invasion of countries. I think none of that really does come to grips with the real issue here, which is that it's a lot easier for somebody who's grown, at, grown up in an atmosphere in which uh, uh, dreams of resurrecting this medieval caliphate, this Islamic state, are normalized, where enforcing Islam is seen as a default form of political expression, the leap from that to joining ISIL is relatively small. And it's that kind of atmosphere, that milieu that we really have, we've been ignoring for decades in this country in the name of tolerance and, 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 and not wanting to appear racist. And that's what we've really got to start addressing. What, what do you make of the, of the fact that uh, one of the two killers of Gunnar uh, Rigby was on the security service radar, uh, that the so-called Jihadi John was also going back now six years was known and yet uh, he is beheading British citizens. My reaction is the same as I expect most of the viewers, which is if someone is known to the security services and not just known on an individual basis, but kind of comes up, keeps cropping up repeatedly, trying to get to different countries, trying to, uh, to, to, to join up with organizations like Al-Shabaab, we need some tighter tracking. And whatever the solution is, we do know that at this point there was a failure. And as a result, something should be done about that. And you know, whether it is a return to control orders, whether it is, whether it is, uh, it's probably not, you know, an exclusive just control orders and a securitization agenda. It's probably not just working in the community. It's a mixture of both. But something has failed in the system. And actually, what I think one, one of the most sort of one of the interesting points here is greater accountability for what uh, for the failures of the security services will help them. You know, a bit of sunlight, transparency mm. that helps performance. You know, whether it's whether it's in you know, the private sector or the public sector, it's the same for the security services. The security services clearly had their suspicions that he, that he was an Islamist or heading that, that way. He had been at Westminster University, which apparently is a hotbed of Islamist uh, activities there, and they've had all sorts of extreme speakers, and that's where he, where, where he met lo lots of, of others. So they, they had their suspicions. Yeah, and it's not as if they were ignoring him either. There's a, a, a cage of set. They were, in their words, harassing. I'd say they were probably actually... Doing, doing their job. Doing their job. <laughs> and if they were trying to turn him, then, you know, good on them. You know, the, the, the way that this, uh, this threat has grown, you know, it's not the Cold War. It's not like we know that it's a fixed enemy and mm. who they are. The enemy is very is moving and it's very, very hard to track. Now, with the killers of Lee Brigby, yes, they may have been monitoring them at all times, but the way that unit, that cell, if you will, worked, it was so unpredictable. It could have happened on any day. There wasn't like they were importing explosives. Mm. They were using knives. And I think the, the only benefit we can have from yesterday's cage uh, press conference is that people are going to have to start realising that this threat is very real. And there are thousands of these people on the street sympathizers in this country and if they are going to go on television and espouse these views it's good that we see them because people need to wake up to this threat it's all very nice and cozy for the guardian to write their editorials and people to sit on twitter and go oh, you know we're not going to have this law and that law but at the end of the day if they, if people's safety is at risk people need to understand that on the figures actually it's it's a, it's a good point you know we we try because we're polite you know british society doesn't really want to confront things but we are faced with this uh, the figures that were released actually by the bbc through a comrade mm. survey uh, just 2 days ago mm. in uh, Harry's point here because 11% of Britain's Muslims have said that attacks on any organization uh, that publishes the cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad are justified. Mm. That same percentage, 11%, have said uh, uh, that, you know, that, that, that um, uh, they, they sympathize with people that will fight against Western interests, and 20% declared. Uh, that they don't believe Islam is compatible with liberal, liberal democracies. And these are huge, hugely worrying and mm. significant percentage points. Okay, we we'll we think we're going to get this guy. We're going to get Amwazi? Yeah, I mean, I mean, eventually we will, of course. I mean, if bin Laden can be caught, if Saddam Hussein can be caught, Amwazi is, uh, is going to be caught. Um, but actually what I worry about is he's come to symbolize something bigger. Um, and what I worry about is just as we killed bin Laden and ISIL emerged, mm -hmm. we could kill Amwazi and, and something else, else emerged emerge, because yeah. we're not tackling mm -hmm. the fundamental uh, appeal of this ideology on the grassroots. Okay, well, thank you for being with us this morning.